Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of webcasts with key figures in the debate on the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. In the hot seat today is Green MSP Patrick Harvey. Aside from the SNP, his is the only other Hollywood party which supports independence. Mr Harvey is also part of the Yes Scotland campaign. But how does the Greens' vision of independence differ to that of the Scottish National Party? Now, you've been sending in your questions this week to Mr Harvey, and we're going to put some of those points to him. Now, first of all, welcome to the studio, Patrick you. Harvey. Uh, when you were joined Alex Salmond at the launch of the Yes Scotland campaign, uh, you said Greens are not nationalists. What did you mean by that? Well, Greens tend not to begin with independence as a, as a starting point, as a, a, a presumption. Uh, very often, I think most often, we end up accepting that uh, Scottish independence would be the best way of achieving many of our political objectives. But our politics are not defined by national identity, uh, either British or Scottish or European. Some of us feel those identities, many of us feel one or, or more of them. But our politics aren't defined by that. Our politics are defined by the social, economic and environmental crises that, uh, that we regard this, this period of time as being uh, defined by. That's, that's what this, the challenges of the 21st century are going to be about. So if you're not a nationalist, why support independence? And why have you decided that constitutional change is the way of achieving your policies? Well, if you follow debates at uh, Green Party conference from time to time, we've debated independence many times over many years, and for as long as I've been in the party, it's been something like a two-to-one majority in favour of independence. And then we fail to fall out about it because, as I say, we're not brought together by that issue as a, as a defining issue of the party. But uh, generally speaking, when we debate how to achieve a, a relocalisation of the economy, a greater resilience against climate change, transformation of our energy system, uh, and challenging the power of uh, the corporate power of, of big business, for example, it's very hard to see how you can achieve that with the existing powers of devolution. It's also hard to see how you can achieve that without much greater powers at the local level. And so a green vision of independence is not just about shifting power from London to Edinburgh. It's actually about changing the, 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 the orientation, really, of the Constitution, sending power up, uh, as little power up the chain as possible, so that more decisions are made locally. What we've seen since devolution, under both pro-UK parties and pro-independence parties, is a centralisation of power in Edinburgh. There's much less in the way of genuine local democracy and local government. And, you know, the, the green vision of independence is one that would feature local democracy much more prominently. Are you a comfortable member of the Yes Scotland campaign? Because, to begin with, you raised concerns, essentially, that it was dominated by the SNP. Are you now comfortable in that organisation? I think that's slightly misstating the, the concerns. We were concerned at the beginning, and I think, to be fair, both the SNP and Yes Scotland have recognised uh, that the, the initial setup wasn't ideal. Uh, and, um, you know, some of the bridge building, some of the relationship building, uh, that's necessary if you're going to have a, a campaign that involves more than one political party and brings in people beyond the political parties themselves. Some of that relationship building hadn't been done and it should have been done before the organisation was launched. I'm pleased to say that it, it's, it's heading in the right direction. I think uh, the, our involvement in the advisory group, uh, which also involves non-political people as well as uh, former Labour Party, uh, MSP and MP Dennis Canavan, as well as Scottish Socialist Party and, and others. Uh, I think that's working well. Um, you know, the, the campaigns, Better Together and Yes Scotland, I think are very aware, though, that there's a year and a half to go yet. And if we spend a year and a half just constantly knocking on people's doors, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to have people deeply frustrated with the process and put off by it. So I think there's a, there's a recognition that we need to you know, develop the relationships that are necessary for the campaign to work, but it's going to have to build over time, over a year and a half, rather than, you know, be all guns blazing from day one. 
Let's move on to the viewers' questions then, beginning with uh, George who sent in, given the collapse of support for independence, this is uh, George's view, uh, is it not time that Yes Scotland was less SNP dominated and other voices are heard? I suppose you've answered partly that question, haven't you? Do you think it is SNP dominated though, Yes Scotland? Well, it would be quite bizarre if, uh, if a pro-independence movement, in the broadest sense, didn't have an awful lot of people from the SNP in it. They are by far the largest uh, and, and clearly the, the most electorally successful political party that supports independence. There's, there's no doubt that they'll be central uh, within the, the Yes campaign. But the Yes campaign, if it's going to be successful, remembering that 49.9% is a fail <laughs> in a referendum, if we're going to get beyond that 50% mark, it's going to have to appeal to a much broader range of people than have ever voted for the SNP, a much broader range of people than those who like Alex Salmond as First Minister, uh, probably going to have to get beyond the, the people who've been voting and reach the kind of people who thought, frankly, that most of politics is a bit of a waste of time, the people who've not been voting for many years. Now, if we can achieve that, uh, I think that's a, a, a goal in itself, re-engaging people with politics. Um, I'd like to achieve that and use it as a means to achieve that 50% uh, and, and get a yes vote. But either way, if both these campaigns can say something, both the yes and the no campaigns can say something positive and constructive about a vision of a better society, I think there's a chance of actually reaching people who've been pretty disillusioned and pissed off with politics for many, many years, many of them understandably so. Uh, Colin asks, opinion polls consistently show a significant majority of those in Scotland who express an opinion being pro rather than anti-UK. Do you accept that currently undecided voters are likely to split along broadly the same lines? And if not, on what evidence do you base your opinion? Well, it's very hard to have evidence about the, the don't knows, the undecided voters. What I, what I can say with, with some certainty is if there are enough people out there who are maybe if people or maybe but people you know the kind of people who are open-minded but not yet convinced they're not going to be convinced by seeing either the union flag or the or the saltar waved at them more frantically they're not going to be convinced by arguments of national identity they're not going to be convinced by anything they've heard yet uh, you know because they have already heard it i think a different set of arguments are necessary and in many ways this is where i sometimes part company with the SNP on policy, on the reasons why Scotland should become independent, the things we could do with those powers. It's got to be about an agenda of change, not one of, of status quo. Corporation tax is a perfect example. You know, the Alex Salmon and John Swinney constantly talk about how it'd be great to cut corporation tax, and they've got very, very rich businessmen who, surprise, surprise, would like to pay less corporation tax, backing them up. This is precisely the economic model that we've seen from the UK governments uh, for 10, 15, 20 years or more. We've seen many, many years of corporation tax cuts, and it's one of the reasons why we've got this chronically unequal society so dominated by corporate interests. We need to forge a different path for Scotland. We need to be recognising that the economic model that just failed us, not just failed Scotland but failed the whole world, must not, not only cannot, but must not be resurrected. How likely is it that that different policy proposal is going to be heard, though, in, in the months to come, given the fact you've accepted yourself the SNP are the dominant element within the Yes Scotland campaign? Surely the, m most folk who are undecided will be hearing Mr Swinney and Mr Salmon talking about how they would like to reduce corporation tax rather than, I presume, you would like to see a corporation tax go up. Or completely redefine how it works so that we're ensuring but that... will that argument get a voice, do you think? Well, I hope so. Um, you know, I'm involved in the Green Party. If I was worried that, you know, I didn't want to be in an organisation that found it hard to, to have a voice that, you know, is, is small and needs to, to grow from very small to quite small and hopefully get middle-sized after that, you know, I, I'd have given up a long time ago if I was that easily uh, downhearted. We do have a challenge, uh, not just to, to put over my party's viewpoint, not just to all of us uh, on the yes side to win the referendum. The whole world has got a challenge to try and grapple with the, the, the debate around ideas. Where are the fresh ideas coming from 
uh, you know, from the, the UK government. They're just desperate to dismantle the welfare state and get back to a, a deregulated free market buccaneer capitalism model. Where are the, the fresh ideas about a, a, a new way uh, uh, of achieving a more equal society uh, from the Scottish Government. I, I think we're not using even the existing powers. And this is somewhere, something I would agree with many on the, on the no side, actually. I don't think we are using the existing powers of, of devolution well enough. If we did that, if we were more creative, uh, things like empowering local government uh, to raise its own revenue rather than stymieing local government, I think that would help to set an agenda, help to set the tone, help to give a, a vision of the kind of reasons we do want people to vote yes, the kind of country we could become. So in Patrick Harvey's vision of an independent Scotland, corporation taxes would go up and so would council taxes, by what you just said. Well, I would like to see a different approach to local government finance, one that is fairer, more redistributive, so that wealthy people pay more and everybody else pays less because the, the issue of inequality in our society is not just about the gap between the rich and poor, it's the gap between the rich and everybody else. This huge tear away uh, growth in the wealth of a tiny handful of people is a burden on the whole rest of society. Empowering councils to make their own decisions whether they want to use a land value tax, whether they want to use uh, a, a property tax of, of a different kind, an income tax, a sales tax. You know, if if Angela Merkel in Germany had tried to do what the SNP have done to local government and tell them how much they're allowed to raise local taxation by, she'd end up in court and she'd lose. You know, in many, many other countries, the biggest share of your taxes actually go to provide local services which are decided locally. A smaller share goes to your regional government and a smaller share again goes to your national government. Now if we change things around in, in that way in Scotland and we could begin to do that even with the existing powers of devolution, we could not only ensure that we're filling the gap, raising the revenue that we need to pay for public services to stop cutting the pay of public sector workers, but we can actually ensure that there's something approaching fiscal policy that could exist at a local level so that democratically elected councils can make decisions that are right for their area instead of having a one-size-fits-all arrangement. You know, what we, Couldn't what we've you do that in the current devolutionary settlement? I mean, you this, is one of your big, this is one of, of, of your big visions. It doesn't need independence to achieve that, does it? You could certainly begin to do that, and we've been arguing for that since before the, uh, the referendum was, uh, was announced, before the SNP had a majority. In fact, one of the, the elements in our uh, election campaign, uh, admittedly, you know, we just hung on by our fingernails. I'm not going to try and pretend that we did better than that. But we've been saying for a long time, for many years, that we need to empower local government instead of uh, stymieing it. Um, now, there's, there's a lot you could do right now. And I think if we were willing to take that agenda, if the Scottish government was willing to say the kind of society we want is like some of those uh, other small northern European nations that Alex Almond likes to compare us to, uh, well, they raise a higher... Uh, a, a higher revenue from taxation. And that's what you need to do if you're going to have those Scandinavian style public services. Is that uh, where you think an independent Scotland should be headed then? Modelling itself on Denmark, Norway, Sweden? In, in many ways, yes. Um, so, so, higher, so higher taxes, but those go to pay for better quality public services. That's the model you would like to see replicated in independent Scotland? Broadly speaking, yes. And the, you know, the Labour Party are quite right when they challenge Alex Salmond on this. They say you can't have Scandinavian-style public services and American levels of tax. That's absolutely right. What the Labour Party won't do is say <coughs> which one they favour. Are they going to carry on cutting services, raising uh, charges on people for education or for prescriptions or whatever else? Are they going to do that or are they going to raise taxation? The SNP are in the same boat though. They, they, they say they want those excellent high quality public services. They're not willing to say how to raise the revenue to pay for it. Another area where we'd, we'd like to, to see a, a Scandinavian approach, some of these countries have public sector energy companies that are coming investing in renewables in this country. Now that's great. I welcome their investment. But why? Why for goodness sake can't we aspire to that in this country? Using the dwindling revenues of, of the oil and gas sector. You know, I think we need to leave some of the oil and gas in the ground, but you know, the, 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 the revenue that we do take from the oil and gas sector over the next few decades, we could be ploughing that into building a publicly owned renewable energy company that would replace the revenue after the age of fossil fuels, so that we're, we're not just handing over this exciting new industry to a handful of and how do you mega fill the gap? corporations. So Sorry? how do you fill the gap between 
spending the, the oil revenue on services you need day in, day out and, and saving it up. I mean, the, well, yeah, it's, it's, obvious, gap there. it's absolutely a balance between taxation and the, and the revenues that are coming in uh, through the oil and gas industry. And, you know, we've, we've seen, for example, uh, not just uh, inequality in personal taxation, but some of the, the biggest companies that have been dodging their taxes for years actually being given grants from the public sector by the Scottish Government. Uh, you know, that's not the kind of thing that we, that we need to be doing if we, if we want to see not only revenue coming in, but businesses that are indigenous being supported to, uh, to do what they do in a sustainable way. Rudy Nicholas, in, in what way is the Green Party's vision of independent Scotland different from the SNP's vision? I think you've spent the last few minutes kind of outlining that. But well, I've been I'm, trying, yeah. I'm not quite sure if, if, if many people will, will realise just some of the other policies that the Green Party have. For instance, we know the Scottish National Party would like to maintain the Queen and maintain the pound. What's the Scottish Green Party's view on those policies? Well, we've, uh, we've had policy in favour of a, a democratically elected head of state for, for many years as well. And I, I do think it's kind of a little bit bizarre to be debating how to create a new independent country and not allowed to debate whether you elect the head of state for that, that country. But, you know, the, the SNP have set out this, this path to a, a, a separate Scottish constitution, a written constitution. Uh, and I think that's really important. You can't just transfer... Uh, sovereign powers into a, a constitutional vacuum and so we need a, a process for developing a constitution that I think some of some of the aspects of what the SNP are proposing need a bit of work the detail needs to be filled in and we certainly need a participative approach so that the whole no, country no can come cream. together and and debate what we want from a constitution now if we get that kind of participative process I'll be arguing for a uh, a democratically elected head of state, many other people will. Some people will no doubt argue for retaining the monarchy, but we'll at least be able to make that decision. It'll be on the agenda, not off the agenda. On currency, you know, the, the, the debate about this in, in some ways is a bit false. The, after there's a, a yes vote, if, we, if Scotland does vote yes, after there's a mandate, it's only then that you'll see the UK government actually being able to talk seriously about what the consequences of that might be and what might be acceptable in terms of a relationship on currency. If uh, a shared currency, uh, you know, if that becomes palatable to the UK government, it might be the best option for the short term. I don't see it as the best option for the long term, continuing to use the pound but not having effectively having a, 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 a currency union but not a political union. I don't see that as a long-term option and I would like us to see, uh, like to see the Scottish Government laying the groundwork. What would be necessary? How long would it take to establish an independent currency? Uh, I, I do think that should be on the agenda. What would you call that currency? <laughs> I think that's about the last question you need to ask. What do you think you should call it? I, I don't mind what we call it so long as Alex Adam's space isn't on the notes. <laughs> um, Hugh McLean asks, whether or not one is for continuing membership of NATO, surely now is not the time to open the debate. The reason for this comment is that surely the, pri the, prim the, the, the priority of the referendum is to achieve independence. Anything else is a diversion and obscures the major issues. Such, as details, such details are for the first parliament of an independent Scotland. I really don't think I could disagree with that any more. Um, the, the questions about purpose, the questions about what kind of country we want to be, about what kind of policies we could put in place with independence, these are absolutely central to the argument that will convince those who are not decided yet. As I said earlier, people are not going to be convinced because you wave a salt arrow at them a bit, a bit more enthusiastically. They're going to be convinced if you, th if, they, if you can persuade them that the decisions we can take are the ones that they want to see happening. Now, joining uh, a, a first-strike nuclear alliance, NATO, even if, and it's a big if, even if you can guarantee that the, the other NATO members will allow you to join when you're insisting that Trident is moved immediately out of the country, you know, it leaves you with two problems. One, the weapons have only been moved. Uh, not put out of commission, uh, and it, you know, we, you'd lose the opportunity actually to tip the balance in the rest of the UK against renewal. Um, the second point is you're asking other countries to deploy those weapons on your behalf. If you join NATO, you are asking other countries to deploy nuclear weapons on your behalf. That's the nature of a nuclear alliance, and you know, if that's what you want, 
if you genuinely want that, why move Trident? Why would you move it if you genuinely want it to be deployed? If you don't want nuclear weapons to be deployed, if you don't want to be part of a nuclear alliance, you don't join NATO. That's its nature. That's what it is. Douglas Sheehan asks, would an independent Scotland need armed forces or could it follow the Costa Rican example, armed forces being abolished in 1948 after a civil war? I think there's very little doubt that you would uh, have a negotiation with the UK government or the rest of the UK government about assets uh, and liabilities and you would be looking to see what proportion uh, of the, the, the military assets that exist uh, and the military structures would become part of the, the Scottish state. But I think the, the real opportunity beyond that is to debate from first principles what is security and defence policy all about in the 21st century because we're still working to this, you know, not even 20th, 19th century mindset of you know, that defence and security is all about defending borders uh, or threatening, uh, you know, m massive international power blocks, the, the kind of Cold War infrastructure that, that Trident represents. Actually, the things that are going to threaten human well-being, that are going to threaten human security in the 21st century, are not about borders, certainly not in this part of the world. It's about land and energy and water and food and climate. These are the things that will threaten human well-being and human security. And I think a, a beginning to develop a defence and security policy from scratch, uh, designed for the 21st century, uh, that's the real opportunity. And I think it would uh, look a, a lot less uh, like the, the kind of institutions that can participate in aggressive wars so no guns. Or, or project, that's not what I said, participating in aggressive wars, projecting military power around the world in the way that you know, airship carriers do um, or, or Trident indeed, I don't think that's the agenda. I think uh, humanitarian intervention under the auspices of the UN uh, is obviously something that will continue to be necessary. But uh, looking to try and prevent the kind of threats to human security and well-being, you know, we could, well, we've already seen wars over oil. We could well see wars over water and food uh, over the coming decades. Trying to prevent those threats is the most important thing we can do to, to safeguard well-being and security of, of Scots and of people around the world. Peter asks, I would like to ask Patrick Harvey if there will be a referendum on joining the EU. As I see things, there is no point at all in swapping one master in Westminster for another in Brussels. In some ways, I do find it curious that there isn't um, a, a significant body of opinion in Scottish politics on this political landscape uh, that's making that case. It's not a position that I would agree with, uh, and uh, you know, there's, there are probably a few people in the Green Party who'd, who'd be in favour of, uh, you know, withdrawing from from Europe. But it's clearly a, a minority. Our party's in favour of, of continuing membership, and you know, UKIP, uh, for all they've had a success south of the border and they've had a few good uh, election results in in, uh, in recent years. They've never made any progress. There doesn't seem to be any appetite in Scotland for an anti-EU position. Uh, Margot MacDonald makes a, a case that we could join EFTA instead of the European Union. Uh, but beyond that, the argument simply isn't being made. How, I'm, how I'm not about to make it because how, I don't believe in it. How do you think the process will work? I mean, this has been the subject of, of massive debate over the last six or seven months. Mm. D do you think that Scotland will automatically retain its membership, as has been said previously by, by Nicola Sturgeon, or do you think there will have to be an application process? The, what I said earlier about the UK government um, only likely to actually talk Turkey seriously after a mandate, I think also applies to the European Union. There will be opinions. Uh, legal opinions are like this, you know, you, you, you can find as many legal opinions as you want and they are just that, opinions. Um, I really think that the situation is only going to be resolved with clarity after there is a yes vote. And so part of our job on the yes campaign is to point out that that same uncertainty exists whichever way we vote. If we vote no, and I think that would be a mistake for a lot of reasons, but if we vote no, we're still looking at a period of incredible doubt and uncertainty about our relationship with Europe because of David Cameron's pledge to try and renegotiate uh, that relationship. So we don't know what the terms will be that he's going to come back with. 
and then to have a referendum about it. And I wouldn't be at all surprised uh, if the, the next parliament at Westminster, the 2015 parliament at Westminster, is every bit as paralysed uh, <coughs> by the, the European issue as in some ways the current Hollywood parliament is paralysed by the independence referendum. Uh, it squeezes out time and space in the political landscape to debate other matters. I'm certain there'll be no prospect of a, a, a genuine proposal for further Scottish devolution if we vote no, because Westminster will be entirely dominated yes by the European issue. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is there's uncertainty in both cases, <coughs> uh, and I think if anyone tries to tell you they've got a crystal ball and they can tell you the future with absolute certainty, uh, I think you should take that with a pinch of salt. Um, so we should take Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmon's words on this with a pinch of salt? Uh, I always take all politicians' answers with a pinch of salt, and you should certainly take mine with the same way. Look, you know, everybody, I think both sides are, are um, sometimes guilty of trying to pretend that they can give you cast-iron guarantees about the future. Life isn't like that. Your life as an individual, the life of this institution, the BBC, uh, the life of our country, life is full of uncertainty. Um, and... Pat Kane said something that I think is really, really important at the end of the Radical Independence Conference just recently. Uh, he said, we shouldn't be afraid of uncertainty because uncertainty contains possibility. I want uh, a referendum which is not just about the Constitution. It's actually about the future of our society. What kind of country do we want to be? If we want to open up possibilities for the future, I think we need to be a bit less afraid of uncertainty and a bit more realistic. Everybody's life and every election, never mind a, a referendum, is full of uncertainty. How do and we you need to be able to make decisions acknowledging that uncertainty is part of our lives. Given what you said about that, how do you think the Scottish Government have handled the European issue in recent months? Well, the, the, the issue about legal advice was clearly badly handled. Uh, but, you know, I think. And do you I think, think it's need... damaged the Yes Scotland campaign, which you're now a member of? Well, I. I, I don't really know about that. Uh, you know, I, I think in many ways, as I said towards the beginning, the, the, the actual active campaigning phase, the door-to-door the, the, the -door, uh, work, if you like, hasn't really got underway properly yet, and, and it, it would be a bit premature to, to, to spend a year and a half doing that. So you know, it's, it's not really clear to me whether it's that, that particular issue is, has damaged things. But we, we need to move on. We need to accept that... If Scotland is going to remain in the EU, the single clearest threat to that is voting no and having uh, you know, voters in, whether it's Eastleigh or anywhere else, uh, voting in a referendum to take the whole of the UK out of the EU when I, I don't think that's what Scotland wants. That's the biggest threat to our continued membership. And if we are going to stay in the EU, the terms of our membership will need to be negotiated whether we vote for independence or whether we go with David Cameron's route and try and renegotiate from within the UK. What would need to be negotiated? Well, there's a host of uh, issues around the uh, financial contribution, around uh, opt-outs to, to different bits of legislation. Um, you know, it, it, in many ways it would be as complicated a, a process as the, the relationship with the UK. You know, I, I believe that Scotland wants to, or the vast majority of Scotland wants to remain in the EU. Uh, it's clear that the, the re relationship with the EU is in a state of uncertainty whether we vote yes or no. And the only thing that I, I the only conclusion I can draw from that is that we'll get the relationship that's defined by Scotland's interests if Scotland's at the negotiating table. Uh, energy is a good example. And energy is, I think, one of the, the areas where, you know, some people might think um, you know, that we have to be part of the UK because. Uh, you know, we, we want to run a single energy system. Well, there's no reason we can't run an integrated en well, electricity let me just ask market. Very, very briefly, yeah. Jeremy Baxter says, um, uh, if Scotland becomes independent, it seems unlikely the rest of the United Kingdom's consumers will subsidise Scottish generators. How then will Scotland's renewable energy industry be sustained? I mean, that's building mm. on the point well, you're yeah. just making. The, this, this, is, this is a, a good one. You know, the, the, the rest of the UK will still have a need uh, to reach its own carbon targets its own renewable energy targets, and some of that will be by uh, consuming electricity produced here. Uh, but the, the wider issue, and where, why it's relevant to Europe, you know, Scotland's interests uh, have pretty high up the top of the list. 
integration with the rest of Europe, a subsea uh, high voltage direct current supergrid to allow us to import and export efficiently without big transmission losses so that we can have different renewable energy sources in different parts of the Europe trading efficiently and effectively. Now, the UK has that on its agenda as well, but it's some way down the list. The top of their list is nuclear power stations for the south of England. Scotland's interests and the UK's interests in the energy system are diverging, and they're going to continue to diverge. And those European-level decisions about where the investment is going to come, how long-term the, the, the planning has to be for that kind of grid technology, Scotland needs to be fighting its corner uh, in that kind of issue. So at the moment, we're, we're, you know, we're running a, an integrated system, but it's being run according to the UK's interests, not Scotland's. And it's, it's one more area where representing ourselves on the world stage would just make a great deal more sense. Scottish Green MSP, Patrick Harvey, thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. Now, that's all we've got time for. But remember, for more on the independence debate, including background analysis, the latest developments on the story, go to BBC Scotland News website and click on Scotland's Future. But from all of us here, thank you very much for joining us. Face good, Matt.